So we're going to meet Shara Evans. She's a technologist and futurist, recognised as one of the world's leading futurists. She uh, melds her engineering background with an understanding of how society is going to change. She's the founder and CEO of Market Clarity, an award-winning technology analyst firm, regular commentator on technology issues on uh, shows like The Project, Weekend Sunrise, Sky News, 7.30 and more. What she does is help people understand new opportunities that arise from emerging technologies. She's passionate about helping organisations to imagine what the world will be like in five or ten years and to help them to innovate and create new products and services that are ready for that world. So please give a warm welcome to Shara. Well, good morning, everyone. It's an absolute delight to be here at the New South Wales Innovation Symposium. This morning, I'd like to talk to you about the future of health. And frankly, there's so much that I could talk about. I can barely do it justice in just 30 minutes. So what I'd like to do is share with you a range of really cool research innovations from around the world. How many of you today have wearables on? Anyone raise your hands? A whole lot of us, right? There's some really useful information that we're able to get about our exercise, our sleep, our body temperature, our heart rate, all kinds of cool stuff. It's about to get a whole lot more personal. The pictures that I'm showing you here are a prototype from UC Berkeley that is taking this down to a whole new level being able to do a molecular level analysis from the chemicals in our sweat, being able to determine the levels of sodium, potassium, lactate, and a whole range of drugs that may be in our bodies. And not only that, but they're bendable and flexible. We're going to see all kinds of new sensors built into not just wearables, but also our clothing, our head glasses, our makeup, and even hair ornaments. There are a lot of brand new business models that this type of technology is going to support. Already, there's a service that's available in the US from a company called Preventus, and it uses a technology called Body Guardian that is a Band-Aid-like heart monitor, and it's used for cardiac patients who have non-lethal um, arrhythmias. And when, or sorry, yes, non-lethal cardiac arrhythmias. So they're ambulatory, but it's able to monitor events in real time when there are any kind of aberrations. Now that can go just to an end user's smartphone, or it could also go to a monitoring service or a doctor's office and allow intervention to take place before a heart attack actually occurs. There are also a lot of innovations in the area of stretchable electronics. There's an innovator called John Rogers who designed a way to take silicon, which is very fragile and breakable, and pattern it like waves into like an accordion, and with that design sensors that are extremely flexible and bendable. One of the first on the market that he's designed is called BioConnect or BioStamp RC. And it's a sensor that actually can be worn on many parts of your body and it contours itself to your body shape like a second skin. It has a 36 hour charge and it can be immersed into up to one meter of water. So that means that you can wear this sensor 36 hours through sleep, through exercise, through getting showers, through doing a whole range of different things. And it's measuring your body movement, EMG, ECG, it's got accelerometers and gyroscopes and providing a whole range of information back to researchers. And it's already on the market today. 
these new wearables are going to open up a whole range of new business models. In fact, one of the jobs of the future that I see is what I would call a personal health coach or a data interpreter. Let's face it, even with today's wearables and applications where we might be tracking the things that we eat and the exercise that we do, it's really hard to figure out what all of this data means. And in particular, if I have a medical condition, how am I going to make sense of this in light of what my doctor or my specialists are telling me? So in the very near future, there will be opportunities for individuals and companies, many of them who may be in the medical profession and indeed GPs or doctors, to take this mass of data with their patient consent and permission because privacy is very important. Use techniques like artificial intelligence to be able to derive insights from the masses of data that are coming from both the devices on our body, what the specialists are determining in different medical tests, and on an anonymized basis, the results of millions of other people around the world, and start prevent providing diagnosis of things that we haven't been able to figure out. Or even if we just have health goals and fitness goals, to be able to guide us as to the foods and the particular activities that will make us healthier. It's going to be a gangbuster market. I talked a little bit about smart clothing, and there are already clothes on the market today, mainly in the athletic area, that have built-in sensors. The picture that I'm showing up on the left side here is from a company called Altos, and they're an athletic gear company. The top has 18 sensors. Two of them are looking at your heart rate and heart rate variability. Two are looking at breathing. And the rest are looking at your muscle movement. And in particular, how hard you're training particular muscles, whether you're overtraining or hitting your target areas. There are also pants that have these sensors as well and do that same type of monitoring. The little bracelet that I'm showing in the middle of this picture is something called the Bond Wearable. And it's a set of bracelets. What's really interesting is that they have haptic technology, that is the sense of touch. So I would maybe have a bracelet, and if I had a child, maybe I'd give my child a bracelet. Whenever I touch my bracelet, my kid would feel the touch on his or her bracelet as well. So that every time you feel a little buzz, you know that somebody who loves you is thinking about you and is touching you from far. Combine this with smart clothing with sensors, and you can start to do some really interesting applications. For instance, one of the big problems that we have on the road today is that people start to fall asleep at the wheel, especially when we have elderly patients or people who drive for a living and they're behind the wheel for very long periods of time. Imagine that you had smart clothing with sensors that detected when you were about to go into a little bit of a microsleep and started to shake you a little bit to wake you up when it sensed that you got to that microsleep. And if you weren't waking up, it will shake you harder and harder. That's the kind of thing that we're going to see in smart clothing in the not-too-distant future, as well as things like being able to give somebody a hug remotely and feel it right in your clothing. It gets even cooler, though, when you start looking at smart materials. The picture that I'm showing on the right side is a piece of clothing that is made from a material called armor gel. And just like the name suggests, this clothing actually hardens up just like armor. It's being designed to prevent elderly patients who are at great risk of bone breakage from a fall to actually not be damaged if they have a fall. I'd like to show you a short clip about how armor gel works. This is what can happen when a heavy object meets a fragile bone. But when protected by a newly developed smart material called armor gel, it's a different story. Armor gel has been designed to protect against the impact of falling onto hard surfaces. Older bones are often more fragile than those of the young, which is why Daniel Plant, a researcher at Imperial College London, 
wants to use his design to create lightweight undergarments or padding inside clothing for the elderly. Armour gel is a synergy of two materials. One is a strain rate sensitive material. It's actually called polyborodimethylsiloxane. It's uh, soft and flowable, so it moves with the musculature of the body, but when you impact it, it momentarily goes rigid. And what we've done is combine that with uh, another material uh, to make these geometries here. Uh, and this material is uh, an auxetic material. When you impact it in, the, in this direction, it actually uh, folds in on itself. And it's the synergy of these materials that give you very good energy absorbing properties. Four times thinner than other similar materials on the market, armor gel becomes rigid on impact, absorbing energy and mitigating the effect of a collision. If we take that here and drop it on a standard material, we can see that it bounces. Yeah, we can do that again. And if we do a similar thing with a, a small piece of armor gel here, we can see that it doesn't bounce at all. You can see where something like that would be really handy, even for people who aren't elderly, because frankly, falling and hurting yourself or getting hit in a car accident is something that could happen to any of us at any time. I talked a little bit about haptics and telepresence. There's a really cool product on the market that's just about to go on sale right now, but I got a look at it and got to play with it in January when I was at the Consumer Electronics Show. It's made by a company called Parahug, and this little bear is called Parry. And what happens is you have these two little bears, and just like the Bond bracelet, you pair the bears together. If I hug a bear, the person who has the other pair bear feels the hug that I'm giving them. So you can again imagine, let's say grandma or grandpa gives their grandchild a little bear set, and you can feel when each other is giving that bear a hug. And there are some other really cool commercial products that are similar in nature that you're going to be able to buy in the next couple of months. Another innovation is in the area of augmented reality, and I know you'll be hearing quite a bit about this shortly, but I wanted to share this story with you. It's called Oxide, and it's a new startup that came out of Oxford University, where neuro researchers were looking at ways of how to use augmented reality to help people who are legally blind to be able to see again. And what they did was determine that by taking out the background imagery and turning that black, like the bottom left-hand picture here, and focusing in on the main image, you're then able to help someone who has partial sight be able to make their way around in an environment. The pictures on the top row are some of the early devices that they had, and they're a bit bulky, and there's a big backpack that is used to both power the device and allow the wearer to zoom in and stop and control into things. The picture on the bottom right is from their website today, and I believe it's actually going to get even smaller than this. You can see that the glasses are streamlined, and the control pack is also much smaller. This can be a life-changing device for people with diseases like macular degeneration or glaucoma that partially um, blocks their vision or a number of other eye diseases. Another really cool innovation is being done out of Brazil, but in conjunction with researchers around the world. It's called the Walk Again Project, and it uses a combination of virtual reality, robotic exoskeletons, and brain-machine interfaces to help quadriplegics gain feeling below their waist and start to walk again. It's had amazing results. So far, there have been eight patients, none of whom could feel anything below their waist. All eight of them now have feeling below their waist. They can touch and feel. One woman who felt nothing is actually able to walk around using crutches on her own. Another woman who had no feeling had enough feeling after going through this procedure that she decided to have a baby. So here's what they did. 
They started off by using virtual reality and immersing patients in a digital world where they had characters that they were controlling through this virtual reality headset. And that regenerated the muscle memory in people's body and started to get those nerve endings firing up again. The second stage was putting people into this robotic exoskeleton with a skull cap on that had a brain machine interface and had them walking on a treadmill to physically get the movement in the body happening again. The third phase was actually combining the virtual reality of controlling a character walking around in the real world while they're in the robot exoskeleton and with the brain machine interface. All of the patients, by the way, also regained functions of their um, bowel and bladder as well. So this is a super promising technology. One of the other really interesting things that is happening is the use of miniaturized technologies, and in particular, one called a pill cam. So I'm going to show you just this little flick. Ignore the fact that it says it's not commercially available. The flick um, is actually about a few years old before they got FDA approval in the US. It's not actually approved. And what you do with this pill is instead of having a colonoscopy in going in th under anesthesia and into a hospital, you go through the normal preparation, but you ingest this pill cam, and it's doing the work of a scope, basically looking down inside the internals of your body and reporting it back without any of the dangers of actual surgery or anesthesia. And the results, as you can see, are just as clear as you would get from a scope. We're also going to see things like this, which is an experimental origami type of miniature robot. It's being designed by researchers at MIT. For some reason, people have a propensity to swallow button batteries, and these get lodged in people's esophagus or stomach lining, and it causes a really big problem with inflammation, and you need major surgery to actually fix it. What this is designed to do is take this tiny origami robot that is able to unfold, they encapsulate it into ice, so the patient actually is given an ice capsule, the body fluid digests the ice, it's guided by a surgeon through an MRI to the exact spot where the button battery is lodged, then it unfurls, it plucks the battery off of wherever it's gotten lodged into, and it injects an anti-inflammatory inflammatory drug right at the spot of the inflammation, and then everything, including the battery, comes out through your digestive tract. Another innovation coming out of the University of Houston are little um, millibots. And these are MRI-controlled, tiny little robots that are 3D printed out of a combination of plastic titanium rods and steel balls. And they work on the principle of a Gauss gun where you're using kinetic energy that's actually driven from an MRI to have one of these rods plow into the other and then through things like tissue. So where it's useful is where someone say has a spinal cord blockage or they have a problem where something is stuck you know, in a vein in, um, or a capillary in their brain. And instead of doing invasive surgery, the surgeons are able to use these MRI-guided millibots, still an experimental stage, mind you, to literally just plow right through whatever that blockage is without having to go through extensive surgery. And the way these millibots get put into your body is just through a hypodermic needle. There's also innovations taking place at Yale University in the early design of humanoid robots. And what they have done is taken a 3D scan of a human hand and designed a robot hand that is modeled on this so that it has the same kind of dexterity as a human hand would have. The idea is that they want to be able to use this as a prosthetic 
for humans. Today, on top of the hand, they have plasticky material that is used to control the hand, and you have a glove where you're using um, the glove to actually have one hand control another hand. But the idea that they want to do is to be able to grow the actual tendons and muscle on top of this robotic exoskeleton and then grow flesh on top of it as well. Imagine if you've lost a limb, you get a 3D scan of the limb you've lost and then you've grown muscle and tendons and skin that matches the rest of your body and guess what? You've got a hand that for all intents and purposes looks and feels exactly like the hand that you've lost. We're at the beginning of an era where humanoid robots could very well become a reality. Artificial intelligence fits into so many aspects of future technologies. And when I talk about AI, many people think it's really futuristic. And of course it is, but work started all the way back in 1956. In the early days, researchers took an approach of trying to figure out how human experts make decisions and write that into software code. Today, using techniques like machine learning and deep learning, what they are doing is rather than hard coding this information into AIs, into programs, they're training the AIs by feeding it masses and masses of data and allowing the AI to learn from these huge data sets that we're generating. A real key breakthrough happened in 2015 when researchers discovered that by using specialized chipsets with parallel processing capabilities, they were able to greatly expand the rapidity at which these AIs are able to learn. And in fact, it's these kinds of breakthroughs that are giving us technologies like driverless cars and computer vision. There are lots of medical applications. One that is particularly interesting is in the field of oncology, where IBM Watson is being used to pour through the thousands of research studies that are produced every single week through conference proceedings, research reports, and match them with very lengthy patient histories, distill this massive amount of information, and present it to a human oncologist with suggestions for courses of treatment for patients. The AI, in this case, I consider to be an assistive intelligence, and it's actually the human that's making the decision, but the AI is doing something that a human couldn't possibly do, which is reading through millions of documents in the space of no time at all. Mind-controlled devices are another really fascinating area. This um, man here, Les Baugh, unfortunately lost both of his arms about 40 years ago in an electrical accident, and he's had a number of prosthetics ever since. A couple of years ago, he was the subject of an experiment at John Hopkins University, where they did surgery to rewire the nerves on his arms and fitted him with robotic prosthetics that were mind-controlled. They were amazed at how fast he was able to do tasks in the space of 10 days to be able to lift items from one shelf to a higher shelf, things that he had never been able to do with a prosthetic. Unfortunately for Les, this was only a temporary solution for him. It's still very experimental. I hope that one day he actually gets to have these back. I actually got to play with a brain machine interface at CES, and it was actually on a sofa in a pillow in back of my head, not even touching me. And I was playing a car driving video game simply by using my mind to control where I wanted the car to go. Now, I did this personally, and the sensor was not even touching me. The advancements in this area are simply phenomenal. Going into the future, one of the questions is, will we be taking more and more technologies into our body, and what will that mean for us as human beings and for society? 
Well, I think we will be taking technologies into our body, and it's going to start with something called smart contacts. So if you can imagine combining the power of augmented reality, that is the ability to see a digital overlay of information on top of the real world. If I were looking out at this audience, I'd know all of your names and have links to your social media profiles and all kinds of cool stuff. Combine that with the ability to take pictures or videos. In fact, Google, Sony, and Samsung all have patents out for smart contacts where you blink and you start to take a picture or a video. And then, here's where it gets really interesting for you, is combining it with biotech. You see, what's happening is the pharmaceutical companies are getting in and partnering with the ICT companies, and they're starting to work on things like smart lenses that also do auto-focusing. So if you're like me and you need reading glasses, no more taking them on and off. The lens will auto-focus directly for you. And by the way, it might give you telephoto vision or infrared vision too. There are other applications that are being worked on where from the tears, um, information in our tears, um, chemicals like glacriglobin can help us me uh, measure insulin levels. No more pinpricking if you're a diabetic. Or measure in real time the amount of drugs that we have in our bodies. And instead of taking a pill every four hours because that's the normal dosage, you could actually be told, hey, you know, the levels are getting dangerously low, it's time to top up. And you actually take something just as needed. This is where we're going to start to see the beginning of the melding of people and machines. And we're looking at about a five-year time frame for some of these initial products to come to market, and probably seven years before it gets to be mainstream. But that's when we're going to start to see app stores like we have for our smartphones, where you will download apps that combine ICT and biotech together. We're also going to see a range of different methodologies to actually connect our minds directly to the World Wide Web. One of the things that's being worked on by Elon Musk is something called Neuralink, a company that he's founded. And he has this idea of wanting to grow neural lace in between your skull and your neocortex. Another idea that has been put forward by Ray Kurzweil is that what we would actually more likely do is use 3D printing with our own DNA to do little nanobots that connect our neocortex directly to the World Wide Web. Imagine wanting to know the answer to a question and thinking the question and getting the answer from whatever the Google of the 2030s might be. Or if you want to send a text or an email, forget about sending that. You're actually just going to be sending brain-to-brain -brain communication. And oops, hope you don't send something out a little bit too fast. Nanobots are going to be very, very useful in drug delivery as well. And in fact, there's already work going on to be able to use magnetic coating on top of little nano particles so that you can use an MRI to guide a little nanoparticle directly to an internal place in your body where you would have targeted drug delivery. There's another project that's being funded by DARPA and one research that's come out of this program from UC Berkeley where they're using ultrasound to be able to embed little, so far millimeter, but going to nanometer sensors directly in your body that can control your nervous system or monitor your organs in real time. There'll be a whole lot of medical uses, but we also need to think about the privacy implications and the security implications as we take these technologies into our body. Stem cells are another remarkable medical technology, and given that I'm talking to New South Wales Health, I'm assuming that many of you know about stem cells. There are two main ways today that stem cells are being harvested. One is through bone marrow, and the other is through your own fat 
in a little mini liposuction session where they take just a small amount of fat out of your body, they spin it around in a centrifuge, and they harvest out the stem cells. It's being used for a range of degenerative and inflammatory diseases. One really remarkable use case is coming out of California in the world of neurosurgery, and in particular with Dr. Christopher Duma, who is specializing in the area of Alzheimer's. So you would know with Alzheimer's, unfortunately, once you have it, your memory starts to decline very, very rapidly. A couple of years ago, he started working with an 82-year-old man called Jack Sage. And what he did was he drilled a hole directly into Jack's brain and started to inject stem cells directly into his brain. Jack has so far had eight treatments. And in the course of these last two years, his memory has improved rather than gone backwards. The volume of his hippocampus has actually increased. His memory percentile rating went from 20% at the beginning of the treatments to 48% after the eighth treatment. It's still very, very highly experimental, and it's paid for by patients. There are now another 19 people who are also involved in these very early clinical trials. But it looks like an incredible regenerative technology. And then we have genetic therapies, and wow, I could spend almost the whole day talking about gene stuff, but there's one that's come out of the Salk Institute where they believe they found a way to actually start reversing aging. A lot of geneticists believe that aging is actually an epigenetic change that can be reversed. At the Salk Institute, they've managed in vitro, that's petri dishes, to take cells from mice and humans and actually reverse age. And in one live mouse with progeria, a rapid aging disease, they've managed to reverse aging of that particular mouse. Imagine, if you could, starting to go backwards in time and looking younger. There's another physicist, Yanir Baryam, who believes that there's actually a genetic switch that will allow us to turn aging on and off. And he thinks that we'll find it within the next 20 years, and that once we do, our lifespans will be five to 10 times what they are today. Imagine living to 400 or 800 years old. So will technology allow us to live forever? And the answer is maybe, but would you really want to work until you're 800 years old? <laughs> Add that in with what's happening with automation and the job market, and you get some really interesting things to think about. And not only that, but these 800 years olds would look probably like they're 20 year olds and be healthy and fit. If you start thinking about the population on our planet, what would that do? And what would that do with the transfer of wealth? Would anybody be able to buy a house in Sydney if they weren't born in already today? So thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this short journey into the world of the future. <laughs>